Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Bite Size Talks. I'm very happy to have with me today Francesco Lescai from the University of Pavia at the Department of Biology and Biotechnology. He is um, very, very busy in NFCore, and among other things, uh, he also worked with Sarek. But today he's going to talk an about another pipeline, which is NFCore HGT Seek. And off to you. Thank you, Francisca. So, um... Today, I'm going to give you a bit of a background for uh, this pipeline and the motivation that inspired us to uh, initiate this project. Um, I'm going to describe the pipeline components. Um, I'll give you some uh, uh, usage um, indications and the performance of the pipeline, and then I'll describe a bit of future perspectives, which is our homework, basically. Um, and I'm going to start with the acknowledgments here. Uh, first to Simone Carpanzano, who's the lead author of this pipeline, but uh, as you might imagine, he's uh, heavily engaged in preparing the defense of his uh, Bachelor of Science now, so he couldn't present today. Uh, Mariangela Santorsola, who is a, a key person in, in, uh, in my lab, and she's also contributed to the publication that describes this uh, pipeline. Um, and then uh, this is uh, very important, I think, because the value of the NFCore community is uh, the availability of all the modules that we also have used uh, in our pipeline. Um, so a very important acknowledgement here is to all the authors um, of the different modules that we have used uh, and which actually make the added value of NFCore so important. Um, so starting from the background of this pipeline, horizontal gene transfer. Um, this is a very known and studied uh, process in uh, biological organisms, and it, it refers to the transfer of genetic material uh, between two different species when they are in close uh, proximity. Um, this has been very important in evolution because it has contributed to new traits, uh, it creates adaptation to new environments and also the capability to use new food sources in, uh, in different organisms. Um, it's been crucial um, in the evolution, as I mentioned, uh, particularly in uh, archaea and bacteria. Uh, but not very much has been known about this phenomenon happening in higher organisms uh, uh, like mammals, for example. So our motivation was mostly inspired by a paper uh, uh, of several years ago that described uh, the existence or the detection of microbial uh, reads in exome sequencing data in human projects. Um, so that paper was really um, um, inspiring for us in the sense that it, it did highlight that microbial sequences have been found in exome sequencing data, which means the coding uh, part of our genome. And it did open a huge lot of questions uh, about these phenomenon in higher organisms. And it definitely needed end-to-end uh, -to -end tools to investigate what, what is happening there. Of course, I put here uh, a funny picture of the microbiome because if you uh, remember the definition I just gave, which is transfer of genetic material uh, between species that are in close proximity, uh, then we and, and uh, many other mammals are the living example of these close proximity between different species. And we have a whole um, uh, set of microorganisms that live with us and contribute to our own biology. So clearly, there's a lot to investigate here. Uh, a couple of definitions for the pipeline that, that we have developed. Um, so first of all, when you uh, map um, next generation sequencing reads, uh, to a host genome, and in our example, a human genome, you could have several scenarios. Um, the first scenario, which is the most common, is that uh, if you do pair the uh, sequencing, both uh, mates in the pair uh, map correctly to the host genome. But you can also have a couple of additional scenarios, one where uh, only one of the two uh, mates, or one of the two members of the pair maps, and the other is unmapped, uh, and one where both uh, reads in the pair are not mapped to the host genome. Uh, we needed a definition for the pipeline, so we have um, identified uh, these um, um, pairs where only one read is mapped to the genome and one is not as a single unmapped. And then we have defined those where uh, both members of the pair are unmapped as both unmapped. So you will find these uh, uh, short definitions later on 
occurring in the in the picture and the slides that we present in a moment. Um, of course, the importance of the uh, pair where one uh, mate is mapped and the other is unmapped is that it allows us to make assumptions about a potential integration site. Because of course we, we can measure and, and, and evaluate the abundance of taxonomic uh, IDs from every read that is not mapped to the host genome. But for those that are members of a pair where one of the two is actually mapped, we can uh, additionally try to infer where that potential integration has happened thanks to the coordinates that we have from the mapping of the uh, mapped member of the pair. So this is the pipeline overview. Um, the pipeline I think is uh, relatively straightforward and includes a part dedicated to the alignment and quality control, uh, then the uh, conversion and parsing of the reads that I just uh, uh, illustrated and classification using Kraken at the moment, and then a last phase of reporting. And we'll, we're gonna see each of these uh, uh, steps in the pipeline in, in a moment. Um, the pre-processing is very important uh, because it's been designed to be plugged uh, downstream uh, to uh, other studies. Um, I made the example of the initial paper that inspired uh, us to develop this pipeline. Um, that was the discovery of microbial reads within uh, human exome studies. So our own idea, particularly because we have also contributed to SAREC, was to uh, plug the, this type of pipeline downstream to those kind of pipelines like SAREC. So accepting the, the bomb files or the alignments that have been produced uh, by human exome or whole genome or genome sequencing studies, and then use the pipeline to process all those reads that have not been uh, mapped. Uh, but the pipeline also starts from a fast queue, so using row reads, and it does a standard align alignment to the host genome using BWA. So are mapped and reads that are both unmapped. Uh, we do this using some tools uh, and using the bitwise flag 13 and five. Um, and then we further parse uh, the potential integration for the single unmapped reads using the information from uh, the mapping coordinates of the mapped uh, member of the pair. Um, at this moment, we are using Kraken 2 uh, to classify taxonomically uh, the reads. Um, and in particular, we have chosen this tool because we using the KMER classification that is given uh, as a sliding window in the uh, NGS read that we are analyzing as a way also for interpreting the results and doing further uh, QC on the uh, outcome of the taxonomic classification. This all goes into a reporting phase uh, of the pipeline. Uh, we generate uh, traditional Krona plots that are generated per group. So if your uh, analysis has one, two, or three different groups, we group the sample of uh, Krona plots uh, per category of your samples. Uh, we use MultiQC as obvious for the reporting. This also includes a classification of a view of all the reads, uh, thanks to the parsing of Kraken 2 um, uh, outputs. And then we perform a preliminary analysis uh, using R Markdown with a parameterized uh, R Markdown files, uh, which also adds a couple of important information to the preliminary analysis. Uh, one is a classification score. So we try and use the information that Kraken 2 gives us in the output in order to um, give a classification score to each of the reads to further allow us to filter based on the quality of the taxonomic classification. Uh, and important information here is the extent of the, so how much of the read has been classified and has been assigned to that taxonomic organism which appears in the result. And then we have also curated from uh, a number of uh, publications, uh, a list of contaminants uh, that are known to affect uh, DNA extraction and DNA extraction kits. 
and we have further classified the contaminants depending on uh, their potential role in human diseases as well. And of course, this is because we are particularly interested in analyzing this phenomenon in, uh, in humans. A um, couple of uh, indications about the usage. This is a typical uh, common line uh, um, to uh, start the pipeline. Um, we will uh, use the input sample sheet as a comma separate value uh, as most of the NF core pipelines. Um, when we use uh, the uh, iGenomes uh, genome indication, we use the host genome there. So this is the first part that performs the host genome alignment. Uh, and then we pass on the host taxonomic ID, which is used uh, to filter the results in the R Markdown report. Um, two very important part of the, uh, this common line are a path to the Kraken database and a path to the Krona uh, database, uh, which can be either indicated as a path if you have it locally, or as a tar -GZ file, which can also be online uh, or in a repository that you might have in a, in a cloud resource. Um, the inputs, as I mentioned at the beginning, can be either row reads with a FASTQ input, as you can see in the first example, or uh, uh, already pre-aligned uh, uh, BAM files that are coming from uh, uh, another pipeline that you can see in the second uh, example of input. Um, and here I also have to say that the database uh, for Kraken is obviously crucial for the classification because the whole point of this pipeline is uh, assigning a taxonomic classification to the unmapped reads. So the way uh, the Kraken database has been built uh, obviously will have a, a huge effect on the uh, results that you're able to report. And so on the taxonomic um, IDs that you're able to detect in, uh, in uh, your reads. A um, couple of words about the performance. Uh, we have tested this pipeline on uh, different species, um, uh, both to demonstrate the existence of the phenomenon in uh, not only in humans, but also in, uh, in other mammals. Uh, this is a, um, an overview of the uh, execution of the pipeline on 10 exons uh, from, uh, from uh, humans. Um, and you can see that they are executed in, a, in our local cluster in about three hours. Um, so this is uh, uh, quite good. The pipeline is very smooth in its run. Um, and then we have also reported CPU and memory usage for the most intensive tasks. Uh, uh, there's nothing major to discover here. I mean, in particular in terms of memory, uh, crack and, and polymap are also uh, quite intense. Um, again, the amount of memory that is used by Kraken definitely depends on the database that is used uh, for the classification. Uh, QualiMap is known to be quite greedy with the memory. Um, in Sarek, it has been uh, um, swapped with most depth. We might do the same in a future version of, of the pipeline for the same reasons. Um, so homework mostly. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, um, Kraken has a very useful uh, type of output where you can appreciate the assignments uh, to taxonomic ID by a sliding window of the k-mers the reader has been uh, splitted uh, into. Uh, this will allow us to draw uh, much more information in terms of classification filters or heat maps uh, that will allow us to investigate better the biology. Uh, is potentially um, uh, regulating this type of events. Um, we will probably um, dedicate some work to the optimization of the computing part of the pipeline. I just mentioned the issues with QualiMap um, and certainly improvement on the preliminary analysis report, which is currently running only on humans um, and also consider the introduction of alternative taxonomic classifiers. And here we have a, a number of examples in other uh, NF core pipelines. Um, so I hope this is enough of an overview for now. We have uh, published a paper on the International Journal of Molecular Sciences very recently, where NF core uh, community is a collective author in the publication as well. And there you can find more details about, particularly about the scientific findings that we have uh, um, um, collected by analyzing the different species uh, we have used for the testing of, of the pipeline. And uh, I'm open to take any questions.
Thank you very much. So I have enabled now for anyone to unmute themselves if they want to ask any questions, or you can also write questions in the chat and I will then read them out. It seems that it was very clear to everyone. So if there are any further questions, you can always ask them in the end of course Slack, um, or you can ask directly um, Francesco, I assume. <laughs> yes, definitely. And, uh, then I would Both like on to- Slack or via email. Yeah. <laughs> then I would like to thank you again, Francesco, and also the Franz Zuckerberg Initiative for funding our bite-sized talks and uh, all of the audience for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you.